Would you take your Bibles now and turn to Matthew 25? Our reading and our message today comes from Matthew 25, 1 through 13. And now let us give close attention to the reading of God's holy word. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish came, uh, took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. May the Lord bless this hearing as well as the reading of his holy word. You know, not many parables of Jesus raise our expectations and then turn around and dash our hopes at the same time like the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Uh, this is perhaps the saddest parable thus far in our study of the kingdom of God. Uh, and we need to recognize that here is, are two groups of people. Uh, and one group expected to get into the wedding feast, but they could not because they were unprepared. Uh, they had failed to do the one thing that they needed to get in. Uh, they neglected the most important thing. And then the other group, well, they had indeed prepared and they were able to attend the feast as they had hoped to. So when the bridegroom appeared at such a late and unexpected hour, one group was gratified to know that they had what was required. And the other went away disappointed, and ultimately they were punished for their lack of proper preparation. Note that this preparation was personal, okay? It wasn't a group thing so much as they all, being foolish, were in the same group. But each virgin had to be prepared on their own. And those preparations could not be hurried, and they had to be well thought out. That, that doesn't take much thought, does it, to realize that preparation by the very nature of it has to be in advance? Okay, there's nothing like hurried preparation because it always misses something. We all prepare for big events, don't we? I mean, think of Christmas. Wow, that's a big preparation. What about vacations or, or weddings or graduations or oh, heavens, football games. Isn't that right? I mean, we, we all prepare for so many things, personal and, and societal and, and all kinds of things. Every society has big events in it. Some of them are very important to those societies, and nobody outside that society understands why. But it's okay. It's important anyway. All the more reason that preparation for eternity should be no less important. As a matter of fact, it should be more important. What can be more important for a sinful human being than to prepare for eternity? We will spend more time in eternity than we will spend on the face of this earth. The problem for many is that the necessary preparations... What needs to be done to prepare for eternity is set by God, not man. 
It is God that gives eternal life. It is God that gives the forgiveness of sin, not man. As much as the woke culture would like us to think that there is forgiveness found in admitting social injustices, that's not forgiveness. No scheme of man can get mankind into God's heaven. So the necessary preparation is what God requires, not what man supposes. And we need to keep that in mind as we are discussing this parable today. You know, weddings then were not like weddings now. Uh, the groom uh, almost purchased the bride. Uh, now, that may sound a little funny, but, I mean, it was understood that, that women could not exist outside the umbrella of protection of a man. So here her, was her father, and then one day would be her husband, and so it was almost, but not quite to the level of being a purchase. The time between the betrothal uh, and the actual marriage cer ceremony could be as long as a year, and during that time, the couple was considered to be married. So we find earlier in Matthew where, where Mary and Joseph were betrothed, they were married, but they didn't live together. Uh, and, uh, and while they were apart, the bride continued in her father's home as the groom prepared a room in his father's house for them to live in. Now, this is important because we can then see why the imagery that Jesus uses throughout the scripture, throughout the gospels, uh, it can be, can be tied directly to this. When the day came for the marriage ceremony, the groom and his party would go and, and they would uh, finish the negotiation, pay for the bride, so to speak, the bride price, and they would then bring the bride to the place where they were to be married. The marriage was, the arrival of the group was usually accompanied by trumpets and loud shouts of, of great joy because for heaven's sakes, there was going to be a great feast for everybody that was invited, okay? And uh, it was the arrival of the bridegroom and the bride, along with the groom's party, that the virgins were waiting for in the parable. That's what they were waiting for. The ceremony itself was attended by family and, and very close friends, a small group. And that didn't offend anybody, by the way. That was the way it was going to be. And then the couple proceeded to the feast which was attended and, and it was where all the guests were invited. If you were invited to the wedding, what it, you, you, it wasn't the ceremony, it was the feast that was the most important thing. So after the groom's father had arranged all the details, prayed, paid the price for his son's bride, uh, then all of that progressed until they arrived uh, and, um, and the, the, uh, the feast began. The ceremony itself, as I said, was uh, attended by a small group, but the father of the groom sort of set the rules as to who was allowed in and who was not. So he set the rules. He said, if you've got a, a you know, gold and engraved invitation, uh, you get in, you know, he's the one that purchased those wedding clothes that we talked about last week. Uh, and while weddings today are more bride-centered, I remember my mother telling me that, that the wedding is the first time that the world can see the organizational ability of the bride. And I thought, that, wasn't, that, that was the organizational ability of my mother-in-law and my wife. But it's true, isn't it? Even today, I, when I put on my calendar that somebody has an anniversary, it's never the husband's anniversary. It's always the wife's anniversary. Guys, remember that. Don't forget your anniversary. But uh, we can easily see, understanding the groom-centered view of marriage, how Christians in the early church understood instinctively the relationship between Christ and his church and how that relationship worked itself out in everyday life. Let's remember the words that Jesus spoke as we find them in Luke 12, 35 through 37. Stay dressed for action 
and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. We will be truly blessed if we are ready when our master returns. But understanding the, the cultural context of the wedding and the feasts that accompany that wedding helps us to understand many things. You know, from this description, it's easy to make those comparisons to, to the second coming of Christ and what we know of it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, oh, and with the sound of the trumpet. Well, there's a connection. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. This is the commencement of what Revelation calls the wedding uh, the supper of the Lamb. But our parable today tells us some vital details that we must address or we ourselves will be found to be unprepared. And so let's consider just the following things, if we can. There were outward commonalities uh, that, that everybody there, all of the virgins that were waiting for the bridal party, the, the, the wedding party to arrive, all of them had in common. They all dressed the same. That was not just something of, uh, uh, of a modern phenomenon. The bridesmaids always have dressed the same to set them apart and identify them to everybody else as being of the bride's party. They had all gathered for the same purpose. They all knew why they were there. They were there for the same reason, to welcome the bridegroom to enjoy as special guest the wedding. They appeared from the outside to be of the same party. As they were waiting for the, for the arrival of the bridegroom, you couldn't tell them apart one from the other. You couldn't look at them and say, well, they're the foolish ones and they're the wise ones. You couldn't tell that. And then they all fell asleep. All of them. Not just the foolish ones, but the wise ones too. Their conversation was about the same things. Have you ever had ten girls get together and not talk about girl things? I had the privilege Friday night of taking the, the color guard of the uh, marching band uh, on my bus. I just happened to pull in in the right time and the right place, I guess. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot different than when, when you have a mixed group or, oh, for heaven's sake, it's a whole lot different than when you take the football team. Okay, a lot of Twitter going on. I'm not talking about the social media. Okay? I, it's just different. And do you really think that these ten virgins didn't have the same things to talk about? Have you seen her dress? Ooh, can you believe that ring he gave her? Wow! Oh, and where are they going on their honeymoon, honey? That's got to be the greatest place in the world. All kinds of things. But they're not talking about the latest football game. I promise you. And on the way back from the football game the other night, I promise you not one person spoke about how well the team played. Not one. Okay? The conversation was all about the same thing. Their experiences and their interests were the same. They all knew the, the bridegroom. They all had a history together of being friends of the bride. Their language was identical. You couldn't tell from their language that they had any difference between them. We might benefit by remembering what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, 
Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? So we did the same things. And cast out demons in your name. Remember, Judas was among those groups that cast out demons and heal the sick in the name of Jesus. And do mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. My mother-in-law used to say that this was the scariest passage in all of Scripture. And I would agree with her. While this passage is Jesus' warning to us, it is not the danger, warning of the danger from others. Our parable and that passage is a warning of the dangers from within our own hearts. But there are also some inward differences between these virgins that we cannot afford to ignore. Some were wise and some were foolish. Proverbs 14, 8 tells us the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Uh, there's another way of putting that. We'll get, get to that in a minute. But some were properly prepared and some were not. And what, what happened was the wise ones thought it through. They realized that the, the bridegroom could come at any time. They didn't know when. And having an extra flask of oil at your side, if it came early, wouldn't hurt. But to have it in case he came late would be of great usefulness. And so they thought it through. But some, well, <laughs> they didn't think about it at all. Some saw the importance of future thinking, as I call it, and some only live for the moment. I call this short versus long trajectory thinking, and if you want to get into a, a philosophical discussion, and I will for just a second, many people in the church today solve problems short term. It, it is a short trajectory. It is a short view. Here's a problem that solved this with no idea of how that short-term solution affects the long-term trajectory that the church is on. That is why we must adhere to Scripture. That is why we must seek in the little things to be found faithful so that in the long run, in the long way of thinking, God might find us faithful. I hope it is then an easy thing to make the, the jump to what Jesus was teaching. We know that not everyone in the visible church is truly saved. We know that. There's no, there's no reason to even argue, but it is good to be reminded. And we live with that. I mean, think of, of, uh, of the parable that we find in Matthew 13, and I would recommend to us that we go back and read the parable of the weeds found there in Matthew 13. But we must also examine our own hearts to be sure that we are not just external believers. You know, it's easy to act like you're a Christian when you're in church. Is it not? It's easy if you work at a Christian school to act like a Christian because all you have to do is act like everybody else acts. It's a little more difficult when you're in a place where there are not that many believers to act like a Christian. But, hey, we're in the middle of the Bible Belt, so it's easy. People, if you don't think that everybody in Birmingham is a Christian, just go ask them, yes, I'm a Christian. And a lot of people would leave it right there. But if you ask them what it means to be a Christian, they will give you an answer that is incorrect. We have been successfully inoculated against the true faith. But we need to examine our own hearts to make sure that we're not just external believers, but internal believers. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 doesn't say, trust in the Lord with all of your habits. 
it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. A proper understanding of this parable requires not just proper preparation, but a brutal self-honesty and a brutal self-examination. And this is why people don't do it. We like to skate along on the surface of our spiritual lives, never delving into the real deep issues of the heart. Because it's easier. It's easier to do that. And it hurts. Who among us wants to go to the surgeon to do something without anesthesia? No. We, no, we don't want that. If you're going to cut on me, you make sure I'm asleep. Your recovery is going to be painful. But once your recovery is over, whatever caused the problem to begin with should be done. That makes it worth it. But that doesn't mean we all jump up and volunteer to go to the doctor because it's going to hurt. We don't like to hurt. We don't like to do the hard things unless they're absolutely necessary. And so when we take that long-range view of our relationship with God, we need to recognize it is the longest of long-range views, and we must take the short steps, though they be hard. Some of those virgins were properly prepared, and some had not, and they thought it through and done what was necessary for any eventuality, and, and then some didn't, and those are the ones that suffered. But this self-examination, this self-honesty, well, we do our, ourselves no favors by thinking that we have what is required for eternal life when we don't. Now, I know all of you, and I've spoken to you privately, and I am fairly well assured in my heart that you are true believers, as I hope you are. But could we be mistaken? Now, here's the, here's the thing. If we are so self-confident that we never examine our hearts, might we be mistaken? Yes. But if we are truly believers and we re-examine our hearts and we find out that we are, well, are we not then strengthened in that conviction that truly our relationship with Christ is set. You see, it does us good to make that examination. But it is a costly thing to live by the lie, the self-deception that we're okay with God because, well, we're, he's lucky to have us on his team. I think you're believers. But that's not the important thing. Remember what he said in the parable? Depart from me, I don't know you. It's not important that I know you. It's important that God knows you and that you know him. What is the real life equivalent of the oil that the foolish virgins in the parable were missing? Well, in a word, it's the Holy Spirit. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. It is an interesting study as you go about the things of life and you find, oh, well, look, here's this church that does that and here's this denomination that does this and here's this preacher that says this. Look for the presence of the Holy Spirit in their work, in their speech. Do they depend upon the work of the Holy Spirit? Does it figure into their thinking because the Holy Spirit is the oil that is the essential quality and here's why. The foolish virgins had little regard for the most essential item they needed to enter the feast. They assumed, and you don't want to know what my father-in-law taught me about assuming. They assumed that what they had would be enough. And then we need to realize that they did not have the Holy Spirit, if you want to make that connection well, how do you get the Holy Spirit? 
Is it by our good works in this life? Is that how we get the Holy Spirit? God sees the good works and he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit because you're such a holy person. Let me tell you a little secret about preachers. Many people equate preachers in other cultures and in this culture as being holy men. Well, my wife will tell you differently. Okay? But here's the thing. Because we spend, we're supposed to spend a lot more time in Scripture, God has a lot more opportunity to work in our hearts. And if God is so gracious, and He is, and if we are so blessed, and many are, the longer we are doing this kind of work, the more like Christ we become. And we could wish it for every one of us that that would be the case. Now, I'm not asking you to do anything that I've not asked myself. I have to ask myself constantly, am I truly his? And yes, I am assailed by doubts too. Sometimes I say, am I really a child of God? And then the Holy Spirit brings to my understanding this very important fact. I am not saved because of how I feel. I am saved because of the finished work of of Christ and his promises that's what saves me it is not my doing that saves me it is his doing that saves me and if I doubt and just act as if he didn't I am calling him a liar and saying that his work is not sufficient and saying that his promises are not true so when, it's okay to ask yourself that question. Am I truly a child of God? But it is not okay to come up with any other answer, if you truly are, then I know from the words of Scripture that God made this promise to me. Because my salvation is not dependent on me. It's dependent on on the grace and mercy of Almighty God for the sake of His Son, Jesus, who died in my place. Let's remember that. The Holy Spirit is essential, but the Holy Spirit is only in the hearts of those who have truly trusted in Christ. The Holy Spirit is not in the heart of those who do not believe in Christ. When you believe in Christ alone for your eternal salvation and the forgiveness of sins, you are a true believer, not because you feel that way, but because God's promise says so. We read in Titus 3, 4 through 6, But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That is a promise. That is a fact. And as Machen would say, J. Gresham Machen would say in the last century, Christianity is a religion based on fact not suppositions. Only true believers have the Holy Spirit, and so only true believers will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb as spoken of in Revelation 19. It is this that makes me sound so serious when I warn against false thinking. So, let's be so honest with ourselves that we can recognize the true nature of our relationship with God. It's the most important thing we can do. It is the most important preparation we can make. By the way, you, won't, you don't have to go into heaven the perfect Christian. Do you know that? You don't have to. 
You don't even have to be dressed like everybody else. You don't have to know all the terminology in the church. You don't have to, to try to blend in. You just have to have the Holy Spirit. And you have the Holy Spirit when you trust in Christ. If we are in Christ, we are His, and He is ours. If we're not in Christ, then we are deceived. What was the difference between the foolish virgins when they were denied entrance and the people outside who were never invited to the wedding to begin with? What was the difference? Ultimately, nothing at all. Nothing. So let's translate that into everyday language. If there are people in the church who are not truly believers and Christ comes again, there will be no difference between the way God treats them and the way God treats the pagans. They will all end up in hell. That's why this is such a serious matter. And heavens forbid that anybody that would sit under my ministry of the word could stand before God and say, I never heard that. But we are still prone to self-deception. If we are not in Christ, we are deceived and we are no better off than those who have rejected Christ and his redeeming work. Let's be careful. That's why this parable at once lifts us up because the presence of the Holy Spirit says we're getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And at the same time, it can dash our hopes because when we do the necessary self-examination, we may find we're not quite in the relationship with God that we wanted. These are sobering words. What a dreary picture for those who discovered that they don't have the Holy Spirit and are not prepared for eternity in heaven, but rather bound for an eternity in hell. And that's the stark difference between the two. If after an honest examination of our hearts, we find that we do belong to God through faith in His Son Jesus, then let's be watchful, shall we? Even as we read in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore you also must be ready... For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. May he find us watchful, fully prepared for his coming. But if upon an honest assessment we find that our relationship to God is based on our own works, on our own definition of what is required for heaven, then let us trust in Christ alone today. Turn to him in faith. Repent of sins. He is freely offered to us in the word of God the free gift of salvation. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all of God's truth even as Jesus promised that he would. Just as a bridegroom in our parable today arrived when he was least expected, so Christ will return in the same fashion. We all have great plans for this coming week, don't we? Yeah. Are they guaranteed? No, they're not. Even if he doesn't return tomorrow or even today, we cannot be sure that we will be here. So today is the very best time to make sure that our relationship to God through faith in Jesus Christ is as it should be. We have been warned. We have been reminded. And with rejoicing hearts, let us confirm that the Lord himself knows us through Christ. And if not, trust in him today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a God who desires that all be saved, although we know not all are, but all that belong to you will come. Father, we know people who think they're Christians and they're not. Let us not be part of that group. And we all know people who are truly yours who, 
who don't seem to think it very important to concentrate on the things of God. But we will not be critical of servants of another recognizing that we ourselves in our journey of faith have been at times immature and doubting. So Father, help us to strengthen our own walk, encourage those who are yours who walk beside us, and Father, help us to think like our God, the creator of the universe, to think like you do about all these things according to your word and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you are our God and that we are yours through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.